Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for participating in our remote meeting of the Environmental Justice Advisory Group. We have two formats for participation today, the Zoom web application as well as teleconference. Please silence your other communication devices, such as your cell or desk phone, so, there, so that there aren't any disruptions during the meeting. During the meeting, all participants on Zoom, except for uh, board, board committee members, board members, and South Coast State Community staff will be placed on mute by the host. That means you will not to, you will not be able to mute or unmute your lines manually. Please note, uh, I'm sorry, after each agenda item, the chair will announce for public comment. For Zoom video, if you would like to make a public comment on the Zoom screen, please click on the raise hand button. If you are using Zoom on your smartphone, please tap the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. For those of you using the phone line only, you can dial star nine on your keypad to signal that you would like to comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line automatically. Speakers will be limited to a total of three minutes for the entirety of the agenda items, plus three minutes for public comment. A countdown timer will be displayed on the screen for each comment. Please note that you can hang up and or leave the Zoom at any time. Please adhere to speaker time limit and treat others with courtesy, civility, and respect. Failure to do so can result in your mic being muted or you being dropped from the meeting. And that's it, Vice Chair. Great, thank you. Are we ready to call the meeting to order and do roll call? Do you think we have a quorum? Let's see here. I don't, I don't think, think we, we have, have a quorum yet. Okay. All right. So we'll just um, maybe get started on meeting minutes. Oh, there's a motion required on that. Yep. How about the review of follow-up items? Is there no problem. no problem? I'll do that. So there's a few action items from our last meeting from April. The first one is um, the staff was requested to provide an update on how many warehouses have filed reports in response to the WARE program. So we're working with staff right now to come up with that numbers. It's, uh, it should be come out pretty fairly shortly. I think we, what we first wanna do is they're gonna present it to, I believe, stationary source and then the board. And then once they present it to the board, then we will notify um, the advisory group. The other one is staff was requested to report on what type of air monitoring, including black carbon is conducted near warehouses. So uh, we are conducting air monitoring around the warehouses as, as part of the uh, AB 617 program in the communities of East LA, Boyle Heights, West Commerce, San Bernardino and Muscoy. <clears throat> as part of these efforts, air monitoring was conducted near the warehouses and in nearby residential areas using a mobile platform capable of measuring wide range of particulate and gaseous pollutants, including black carbon, nitrogen dioxide, and particle number concentrations as tracers for uh, diesel exhaust. We also executed uh, a contract with ACLIMA uh, that will be conducting intens intensive mobile monitoring 24 hours a day, seven days a week between July 1st through September 31st in both of those communities. The next item is staff is to research whether EJ can meet at the CARB headquarters in Riverside. So we have been talking with uh, CARB staff about that. Unfortunately, right now they don't have a policy of allowing outside uh, um, groups to come in and use their facilities and they're coming up with that, but they're gonna let us know once um, they have a policy. Okay. Next one is staff uh, was directed to reach out to Mr. Don Smith, who's on the advisory group for further details regarding the requested discussion on hazardous and toxic substances in the school and residential areas. And um, Alicia, do you know, was that had to do with Jordan High School? Do you recall? I think it was Jordan High School specifically. No. no. Okay. All right. And so uh, we have reached out to Mr. Smith, but he hasn't uh, given us um, the information yet. And then lastly, staff to agendize an update on indirect source rules related to ports and rail yards. Uh, that's gonna be coming up in the October EJ uh, meeting. So that's coming up. And Vice Chair, that's it. Okay. 
All right. Um, for those of you who are just joining, we um, skipped to item number three while we were waiting for folks to log on. Um, I'll ask if there's anybody who would like to speak on item number three, the review of follow-up items report by Derek. And I don't see any hands raised. Nobody's jumping up to talk about that. So maybe we can scroll back to see if we have a quorum. Do you want to call roll, Alicia? Sure, we'll have uh, Brisa. Oh, Brisa. Today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Senator Delgado? Here. Supervisor Rutherford? Here. Board member Padilla Campos? Absent. Elizabeth Alcantar? Reda Alexander? Manuel Arredondo? Here, present. Thank you. Angie Balderas, Dr. Larry Beeson. Here. Suzanne Bilodeau. Paul Cho. Carrie Doy. Dr. Afif El Hassan, absent. Mary Figueroa. Here. Angela Garcia. Here. Kareem Gongora. Ana Gonzalez. Present. Dr. Monique Hernandez. Dr. Jill Johnston. Humberto Lugo. David McNeil, Daniel Morales, Donald Smith, Rafael Yanez. Present. We do not have a quorum. Okay, why don't we um, see if we can establish a quorum as we move forward? to presentation since we don't need motions for that. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah, all right. So um, let's skip then to item number four, the draft 2002 um, AQMP. And, and again, welcome to all those who could make it today. Um, hopefully we'll still have a productive discussion today. And this is Seng Mi Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the advisory group. Uh, advisory group. I'm Seng Mei Lee. I'm Planning and Rules Manager of Overseas AQMP. So today uh, we're presenting this uh, 2022 draft air quality management plan. This has been presented in different occasions in different advisory group meetings. So it might be not first time to some of the members. But anyway, we will proceed with this presentation. Next slide. So uh, air quality management plan is a reasonable blueprint to improve air quality and achieve federal air quality standard. US EPA has the primary responsibility to establish the federal air quality standard and they periodically review it. So the latest one was uh, happening in 2015 when they strengthened ozone air quality standard to 70 parts per billion PPB, and this triggered uh, the AQMP development. So this specific AQMP addresses control strategy to meet air quality, ozone air quality standard by 2037. Next slide. So South Coast Air Basin has made great strides to improve ozone air quality over past decades. As evidently from these two photos, the progress has been, has been substantial. However, still we have the worst ozone air quality in the entire nation. And then we are among the worst fine particulate matter air pollution in the nation. Next slide. So this line graph presents 
the progress in ozone air quality in quantitative sense. So here, blue lines represent the South Coast Air Basin ozone level, and red is Coachella Valley level, how they changed in past four decades. Evidently, we have made great uh, improvement. However, still both the South Coast and Coachella Valley are above federal air quality standard. So federal ozone standards are depicted as solid, uh, depicted as bold broken black line here. You might also notice there has been slight uptick in the recent years. This was due to adverse meteorology, despite the continued reduction in emissions. Next slide. We are focusing on ozone. That is because there is adverse, adverse health effects associated with them. So ozone is known to irritate respiratory tracts. That means it increases coughing, sore throat, and increased chronic bronchitis, and also susceptibility to infection, and it, it promotes inflammation and in increased asthma attack. Also more importantly, the precursors that form ozone also contributes to PM2.5 formation and PM2.5 is known to cause premature death. Next slide. The key pollutants to improve ozone air quality is nitrogen oxide or NOx. So NOx is typically formed during a combustion of fossil fuels such as gasoline or any natural gas or any fossil fuel related fossil fuels. But in the the bar, or the bar graph on the right represented total NOx emissions estimated for the South Coast Air Basin. The first orange bar is 2018 condition, more or less represent current levels. And the second bar is depicted as 2037 business as usual. Under business as usual condition, there are ongoing implementation of already adopted regulations and program they will continue reduce emissions in future years. However, the CQMP identified that business as usual reduction is not sufficient to meet 70 PPB, but 60 tons of NOx is the maximum amount of NOx we can accommodate while still meeting ozone, uh, ozone standard. This is 60 ton level. It is 83% reduction from current level and the 67% additional reductions from business as usual condition. Next slide. So then where does NOx emissions come from? So here we categorized for stationary area source in blue and the mobile sources. We also include emission contribution from current day 2018 and future uh, attainment target year 2037. In current days, so more than 80% of total NOx emissions coming from mobile sources, while on-road and off-road more or less share equal amount of contribution. However, when it goes to the future year, this individual contribution changes, and it's obviously the contribution from off-road mobile side increases quite a bit. This off-road mobile includes categories such as ships, aircrafts, trains. Next slide. Then the question is then who has responsibility to reduce emissions of certain sectors? There are definitely local agencies like us and the state agencies like CARB. However, substantial amount of emissions are under federal and international authorities. In 2037, business as usual condition, more than one third of total emissions are regulated by international and the federal authorities. This includes, of course, ships, aircraft, and locomotives, of which activity levels are expected to grow in the future. However, the local uh, agency or SIP cannot assign emission reduction responsibility directly to federal government. Still, it is very clear that attainment is not possible if federal government do not do their share of emission reductions. This effect is very obvious in the graph on the left. See the federal, the, the amount of emissions under federal authority is more than 
the 60 ton that we can accommodate while still meeting ozone standard. Next. So this bar, bar chart proposes where emission reductions coming from. South Coast AQMD's proposed control measures are going to reduce 32 tons of NOx. And the sources that under CARB's direct regulatory authority is expected to reduce 30 ton. And then CARB also proposes measures to reduce emissions from trains, so that's 11. But very obviously, 51 tons of reduction needs to be done by federal action. And then we can go down to 60 ton level, which is the attainment level. Next slide. Regarding its regulatory authorities, the amount of NOx reduction needed to attainment is, like, is substantial. Therefore, traditional, therefore, innovative approaches are necessary. Traditionally, air pollution control focused on the emission reductions from tailpipe of vehicles or at reductions from exhaust stacks of certain facilities or promoted new engine technology or improved fuel efficiency, et cetera. However, the amount of reduction required for the attainment is beyond and above the level that traditional approach can, can achieve. Therefore, this plan proposes society-wide or industry-wide transition to zero emission advanced technology where they are feasible. Next slide. So here are the control strategies we propose in this AQMP. There are NOx control strategies, and also we pursue co-benefits from greenhouse gas reduction, which the state of the government, the state of California is a strong drive for. And we also propose limited strategic VOC measures, and then there are other measures. Next slide. For stationary area source control measures, the traditionally we have focused on, on more larger combustion sources, and this AQMP continues that effort. Therefore, we pursue emission reductions in industrial combustion that includes boilers, process heaters, refineries, electricity generating units. This AQMP also proposes emission reductions from commercial and then residential buildings and the combustion sources included in such buildings that includes water heating, space heating, and other combustion units. Next slide. South Coast AQMD also proposes mobile source measures. We categorize into three here. So the first one is facility-based mobile source measures that focuses on airports, marine ports, rail yards, and warehouses. We also pursue emission reductions by limiting the growth in emission activities. We also promote clean construction, and then uh, we focus on new and redevelopment projects. We are also promoting um, the partnership with other agencies, including national and then even international entities, and we will continue pursuing incentive approaches. Next slide. Public participation and feedback are critical component of AQMP. Throughout the development of AQMP, we reached out publicly in many different venues, including working group meetings, advisory group meetings, public workshops, and individual stakeholder meetings. And then when we and then once we released the draft AQMP, we also solicited written comments from public. At the same time, we collaborating closely with other agencies such as state agency, CARB, CEC, PUC, and federal agencies like EPA, DOE, DOT. Next. So this briefly summarized the development process that we recently completed and plan to continue for the rest of the year. As mentioned, draft AQMP was released in May 6th of this year. We received the comment till July 22nd, and currently we are revising the AQMP based on public comments we received during the comment period. And then we periodically update our governing board uh, at the governing board meetings and committee meetings. We plan to bring this back to October governing board, uh, governing board meeting. And then in mid-October, more specifically starting from October 12th, we are hosting five regional public hearings 
We're hosting multiple meetings to accommodate more participation from uh, public members. And the plan is bring this plan to board consideration in December. Next slide. So best way to stay informed with the activity of AQMP is signing up e-newsletter as instruction is given here. So this concludes my presentation on the AQMP. Thank you so much for that, Seng Lee. Um, I know there's, there's a lot there to digest. So I'm gonna go straight to questions from um, the committee. And I saw Kareem's hand uh, raised First, before I um, call him up, I just wanted to do a quick check. Um, Brisa, did you see any other committee members join um, for quorum purposes? We did have a couple join. Kareem joined Donald and I believe Suzanne as well. So that puts us at a total of 10. So Nick, Nick, does she have to say their names and they have to respond or is that okay? Just seeing their names on the on the screen. I mean, I mean, yeah, I guess to make sure we have 10 for quorum. Um, Just call the names, Brisa. Those I that should, are David that were absent. Up too as well. David McNeil showed up as well. Great, great. Oh, so just the ones that were absent, Brisa. Okay. Elizabeth Alcantar. Reda Alexander. Angie Valdera. Paul Cho. Terry Doy, Dr. Monique Hernandez, Dr. Jill Johnston, Umberto Lugo, Kareem Gongora. Present. David McNeil. I'm here. Daniel Morales and Donald Smith. Here. And we have a quorum. Wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna continue through item number four and then we'll go back to item number one. All right, Kareem, you're up. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I apologize for my late arrival. Um, I had a question and uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question uh, in regards to the AQMP and how that informs land use agencies on uh, developmental pollution impacts. Um, some of my concerns have been along the way of what type of data source is required to be used to meet our thresholds. And in my opinion, I think some of the thresholds are far too high. So I guess like, how do we source that data of what informs our thresholds? Is it science-based? Is it based on what uh, the EPA is saying, like, like how does that all fit in? I'm sorry to, to put it all together, but I've had some very big projects come my way in, in, in where I serve. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering where the data is coming from. So, uh, Karim, could can you a little bit clarify what threshold do you mean here? So it's the parts per million. Um, and the way that's measured when it comes to the CEQA process, uh, most most of the time, I we we get that uh, additional trips and and vehicle miles traveled won't it won't even meet or markedly close to the thresholds. But then you look at the outcomes and you and you go outside and and you know there's a, a significant amount of pollution in the ozone. And so I'm trying to better understand how we calculate those thresholds um, for those processes. So. I, I will start with a kind of a general AQMP process, so how to bring this technical data into the plan. So there is an emissions inventory portion that's looking into all the, de all the variety of sources, including heavy duty truck trips, and then different facilities, and then different types of vehicles that operating at different location of the basin. And this type of information are eventually uh, converted to emissions inventory and that uh, uh, emissions inventory. And then there are chapters and actually more specific chapter three and appendix three of the AQMP explain that uh, process very in detail. 
Second, and there is an impact, so pollution-wise, so let's say pollutants being emitted from a certain type of vehicles around a specific land use, and then the, that impact, that pollutant will trans, uh, it will travel, and then also going through chemical reaction, that's how it forms ozone. This type of transport and then chemical reactions are being uh, calculated using atmospheric chemical chemistry model, photochemical model. And that's how we estimated a 60 ton of uh, the maximum allowed NOx levels while meeting the standard. So in general, so the this uh, uh, truck trap trip information or certain type of land use, for example, let's say the location of the commercial buildings and residential buildings type of information are first rolled into emissions inventory. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Can I step or ask or answer this a little bit? My name is Ian McMillan. I'm Assistant Deputy uh, Executive Officer here in our planning division. Uh, I, I think what part of your question too is, so the standards that the AQMP is based on, that's a health-based standard that's developed by EPA. And they look just at the health science of, you know, how does ozone affect humans? And so that's how the AQMP is developed. Uh, mm -hmm. We rely and we're required by law to, to meet those standards uh, that are health-based okay. standards, which is different a little bit than what you brought up for CEQA. Now under mm -hmm. CEQA, that is each land use agency the cities and the counties, they are the ones that set their own standards for what they think is appropriate for land use. As the AQMD, we can recommend thresholds and recommend guidance depending on which pollutant you're talking about, um, but it's really up to those land use agencies to set their own standards. Understood on that end, but they reference AQMD um, documentation when it comes to uh, how the uh, how the impacts will will not have a significant impact, and so I guess what I'm trying to do is identify what tools we're using to inform land use agencies, um, because I know for the most part they subcontract out their environmental consultant, and so I guess I guess for me I personally feel that um, they don't have the best data and they're not really provided the most accurate impacts because. You can look at Cal Enviro screen and know that there's significant impacts in an area in a region. And so the additional trips of, 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 of heavy duty truck traffic is gonna create additional impact. So I, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around that. And I know the AQMP is the overall, from my understanding is the over, overall policy document getting us to uh, meet our, 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 our benchmarks. And so I guess that's where my, my brain's trying to go. Um, but I, I could follow up with an email. I'll go ahead and, and just see specifics because what my concern is, I think outdated data is being used. I don't feel like um, the, the correct data is, is being used to help model some of these things. And, and, and that's just maybe a personal opinion, but I think the thresholds are too high and, and I don't know who sets those. Yeah, Kareem, I think the question that you have is related to the air quality section of a CEQA document and what standard we use for that, which I don't think the AQMP touches that, but I could be wrong. Um, Ian, if you could opine on that. Sure. There's Under CEQA, there's a number of different questions that every land use agency has to address. One of them is, uh, does this project conform to the AQMP? Uh, and that's just as yes. it concluded in the analysis. But there are a whole bunch of other questions that typically come up when you're talking about thresholds. Do you have a certain pounds yeah. per day? Do you have a certain risk level? Something yeah. like that. Those uh, those are all set by the, those local land use agencies. Um, okay. And so what there is, you know, we have guidance that we develop. Uh, that guidance goes through public process. Uh, we're actually wow. looking at some new guidance right now on cumulative impacts uh, in relation to CEQA. And there's a public process going on with yes. that. I encourage you to get engaged there. That's one component there of CEQA. You go. It's not all of it. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, that, I, think, I think that's what you're looking for, Kareem. And oh, if, yeah. if you'd like, I know that's come up in the past in this committee, so I, I don't want to add to staff's um, you know, workload, but I think a, an update on that might be beneficial at our next meeting. Uh, yeah, I, I think so, because, I mean, in all honesty, you kind of the Illinois Empire, you look outside and the, and the air just looks awful. And so I'm just wondering, how are we making progress if it just looks more awful? But um, yes, thank you. That, that's exactly what I was looking for. So thank you uh, so much for answering my question. I really, truly appreciate it. Thank you. 
Okay, so I know Derek took a note on that, that for the next meeting, whoever is um, structuring that public process, if, if we could help inform the committee so they can get involved as needed. Do you want this, do you want that to be an action on vice chair where we'll, uh, the, we'll pose the question, we'll get the answer and send it out to everybody or do you want the presentation? Whatever is the most beneficial, because I think the intent is that the committee members actually want to be involved in that public process. So okay. if it's easier to to where where that we'll just, is, it's we'll come up present. in the past. Yeah, we'll just present. Okay. All right, um, Rafael Yanez is up next. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. So thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for the presentation. Um, really useful information. Um, so I guess we've been talking about a lot of these very same issues, um, related to the smog, the ozone emission, and while strides, strides have been made by the district over the years and over the decades, I, I think, you know, we have to go further. And, you know, one of the pri previous meetings, you know, they, they spoke about thinking out of the box. And I believe that um, I would encourage all executives, including the governing board members as well, to start thinking out of the box because of this climate change, because we're, we're reaching, or probably have already reached the precipice and are going over the hill now. And a lot of these, these changes that are currently being made in the environment are almost irreparable. Um, but they can be mitigated to some degree. And so similar to a page taken from CARB in their um, taking a hold of the automobile air emissions um, and granting certain privileges from the federal government, I think we need to do the same thing in regards to working with the greater Port of LA and Port of Long Beach complex and lobbying federal governments to encourage the shipbuilders to downsize. Because I think what, what's happened is, you know, we've become a more import um, related type of, of, of society. Um, our consumerism is just going through the roof right now. And so consequently, and because of course the pandemic and of course future pandemics we, that we're gonna continue to have, likely you'll see a, a, a greater increase in the amount of shipping containers coming into the ports, larger ships still, um, and it's a problem now. Uh, many of the shipping companies and whatnot and, and even small businesses are finding that shipping is becoming a burdensome uh, cost that's being passed on the to the consumer, of course, and escalating this whole, you know, economy, um, this, um, um, you know, inflation, all this other stuff. And as well, these larger ships, there's no regulation on them. So consequently, as you, as you understand, especially from the uh, AQMP, most of the pollution is coming from a lot of these ships coming in, the rails that are, that are trafficking all this, uh, as well as the truck traffic going into and out of the port because of the record number. We're breaking records every single year in the number of processed containers coming into and out of the ports, as well as the expansion of a lot of these distribution uh, warehouses and hubs. And so, again, you know, looking at the AB 617 um, program and goals and whatnot that we're trying to, to target these, these EJ communities in, in significant reduction, we're not going to meet those. We're, we're ultimately not going to get there unless there is meaningful discussion amongst executives, amongst the government in order to help um, fund some smaller um, shipping. So that way it, they, those ships 
rather than coming into the Port of LA and Port of Long Beach complex, they can actually be diverted to uh, San Diego or San, uh, uh, or um, San Jose or the San Francisco Bay. Because right now, those super containers are so large that they're driving a lot of these smaller um, companies out of business as far as shipping is concerned. And again, now there's only a few China shipping, Merck, you know, that have merged and become these, like, uh, essentially what OPEC is now. But in the shipping in the shipping side, now they drive the market in terms of shipping, shipping costs and all this other stuff. And the only ports that are available to uh, for these super containers are the port of LA and the port of Long Beach here in Southern California and nothing else. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for those comments. Um, definitely the, the, the ports and all their activity is, is a huge issue. We're, we're creating a whole role around shipping and, and what we can control. So I know that that's calendar for 2023, but um, we can continue to follow that as well, Rafael. So thank you for your comments. Um, Angela. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for that presentation. I, I do want to echo what um, what Mr. Yanis was talking about. And particularly, I'm going to look at the figure that you presented on your page seven of the presentation, where it, um, where it summarizes where the NOx emissions from 2018 to 2037, you know, the, the biggest increase is coming from off-road mobile. So my question would be, is there anything that AQMD is working on to try to reduce the off-road mobile sources in, you know, in particular from the ships and, and the aircraft that are all probably all being um, increased in the area of the ports and in the airport there in LAX? It, just wondering how we're, what we're doing to try to mitigate you know, the air emissions from those sources. So I can go first, and I know there are many experts that can chime in more details. So there are multiple fronts that and strategies proposed in the CQMP and also our sister agency, California Resources State SIP Strategy. And then we are still proposing some emission reductions from the sources that are subject to federal uh, authorities primarily as much as the local agency and state government can do it. For example, some of the measures are targeting uh, cleaner ship visits and then cleaner engines for locomotives and then uh, and then also, we also are pursuing the emission reduction from the entire airport operation, which is part of our facility-based mobile source measure as well. So this is a control strategies we are proposing. However, behind the scene, also the AQMD is working very closely with various levels of federal government and then other agencies. Um, so for that part, maybe I can I can pivot to the Lisa or Derek to come up with a little bit more specific details about how our agency is doing in coordinating with other governments. That's Lisa. Great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Tanaka. I'm the Assistant Deputy Executive Officer for Legislative and Public Affairs. And um, to Sang Ming's point, we have been working with our congressional delegation as well as the federal agencies um, to look at programs and policies to reduce emissions from these sources. And I'll just point to one quick example. In the recent Inflation Reduction Act that just passed, there is a new program specifically for ports. It's $2.25 billion to reduce emissions from ports and goods movement, and an additional $750 million for ports within non-attainment regions. That's a huge change because there, there are just a few programs specifically for non-attainment regions, two which were just recently created in this bill. So we are working um, and coordinating with our delegation and the agencies. We meet with them on a regular basis and it will be a continuing effort. Ms. Tanaka, you mentioned something about long, non, you said $2.5 billion for ports and what was the other one for? It's $750 million for 
for ports that are located in regions that do not meet the national ambient air standards. So we don't meet for ozone and PM 2.5. So that puts us in a special category to apply for the funds just for regions that have ports that don't meet the federal standards. And what would that money go towards? So the program is fairly broad, but it includes things like um, when the ships come to call for to plug in um, for zero emissions equipment um, to, you know, anything to reduce emissions related to goods movement in the ports. Okay. And then, um, well, thank you so much. That was very mm -hmm. informative. And I just do have one question and I just want to make sure I get the correlation because I found it very interesting was um, the ozone trends in the South Coast Air Basin, Basin and how they've been increasing since 2016 um, due to the adverse meteorology. So the lack of rain is causing um, the number, the NOx numbers to go up? Madam Chair, <laughs> can step answer to the question? Mm. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, it's way more technical than I could answer. Yeah, sorry that I jumped on right uh, right off right on the previous question. So yes, that's a good observation. So there are multiple factors that uh, um, affecting that um, the kind of increased ozone levels uh, measured in, uh, observed in past five six years. That one thing is of course the precip precipitation matters, but that affects more winter time and PM levels. And but ozone concentration is more closely correlated with the temperature actually. We have experienced more uh, high, more number of hot temperature days. When there are high temperature, actually there are the volatile, volatile organic carbon emissions coming from even the trees and grasses and vegetations. And that also promotes uh, the ozone pollution as well. So this adverse rhythm meteorology includes the temperatures and the humidity, and then also even the wind speed that can ventilate the pollution out of our basin. However, somehow all this combination of this adverse meteorological factors in our uh, contributed to higher levels of ozone. Very interesting. Thank you. That was very informative. Thank you so yeah. much. It's so counterintuitive that sometimes trees cause more pollution. Um, it's such an odd um, science, but uh, but yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, okay, we've got uh, Ana Gonzalez who's got her hand raised and then we'll go to Suzanne after her. All right, hello everyone. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Um, so I wanted to ditto everything that member Gangora and member Yanez mentioned earlier. Um, so one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm seeing in the AQMP that's lacking is like the enforcement of air monitoring. Um, how can we in the plan um, create some kind of like program or um, funding for AQMD to um, oversee all the air monitoring that's happening in the region and also invest in black carbon monitoring. Um, because, for example, as you know, we look for data through the AQMD website and CARB and EPA, we're, we're noticing there are areas in our communities um, that don't have any monitoring at all. And even though, you know, the regional air quality is, is similar, we still need to detect where the real um, PM um, and ozone and NOx levels are coming from. And we all understand that it's coming from the warehousing because of the truck traffic. And so my question is, how can we invest more money in, in black monitoring, uh, I'm sorry, black carbon monitoring, and, uh, you know, somehow plug it into the AQMP so then we can get those federal and state dollars uh, to really get the raw data that we need? Um, because I guarantee you that we're all over, over, um, ex over exceeding the thresholds that, that Kareem was talking about earlier. And it doesn't help us in our advocacy for clean air um, when we don't have proper monitoring happening on the ground, such as Moreno Valley. And so I, I just wanted to bring that up and also ask those questions. And also we can, maybe for next time, um, if the HMD staff can provide a presentation on what kind of monitoring uh, systems you guys use, so then maybe we can, you know, suggest some uh, other monitors that are really going to collect that raw data that we need to achieve clean air. Somebody take that question, yeah, Ian? 
Yeah, uh, so that's a really good question. And monitoring is, a, you're, you're right, it's a really critical component of, you know, planning for clean air. It's, you know, we do a lot of uh, exercises on uh, evaluating emissions and, uh, you know, uh, modeling, computer modeling, uh, but it has to be grounded in, in, you know, what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, we do have a very robust monitoring network. Uh, one of the densest monitoring networks probably anywhere in the world are the rooms for improvement. We, you know, part of how we look at that question is every year, actually, we go through a monitoring network plan uh, and we, we take a look at that. Actually, if you go to our website and you look at clean air plans, most people go to the AQMP, or at least we like to think most people go to the AQMP because that's what our, our team is working on. But uh, listed under there as well is our monitoring network plan. And we actually go through that analysis every year of looking at where are our, our monitors sited, uh, what kind of pollutants are we looking at throughout the basin. Uh, and so we do look at that every single year, actually. Uh, this particular plan, you know, you're, you're raising uh, concerns about black carbon, very understandable of, you know, why there will be concerns about black carbon and its relation to particulate matter. This particular AQMP is focused on the ozone standard. And so we're really thinking more about this plan tied to ozone. But, you know, thinking about your question about black carbon, I think that's probably the right place to, to bring up some of these questions is when we go through that monitoring network analysis. And that plan uh, needs to be approved by EPA, right? And there, there are certain criteria and conditions we need to meet uh, under EPA um, uh, well, requirements and guidelines. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Thank Ian. You. Okay, we'll go to Suzanne, and then our final hand up is David McNeil. Hi, um, I actually don't have a comment. I just didn't have my name on the roll call when you went through the missing members. So I just wanted to make sure I was counted as present. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, okay, bye. bye. All right, David, your turn. And then it uh, looks like Manuel would like to speak after you as well. Thank you. Um, I missed most of the presentation, but I read through it a couple of times now. And, and I was just curious on, on the end relative to incentives. And that's part of the, the method that, you know, we're working on to in, make people incentivized to, to clean up their facilities. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that, that, is there an approach that it deals with environmental justice in terms of credits being issued to facilities uh, that are that, you know, being incentivized to meet the law or is there a way to get them to go beyond what they're supposed to do if they're gonna get uh, credits in lieu of just getting credits for doing meeting the standard? So how are you addressing the, the credits um, in a way that is different than what Reclaim has done in the past, which as you've seen has had a lot of environmental justice impacts where the polluters aren't doing the things that they need to do in these communities that are impacted so heavily? Great question. Um, somebody on the team take that one? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take a first crack at it and then you know, welcome anybody else to, to fill in. I, you're obviously highlighting a uh, great question, highlighting one of the real key challenges that our region faces is environmental justice. And how do we think about uh, our specific measures that we're proposing in the AQMP, which is really trying to address regional pollution. But we know that we have these dis disproportionate historical impacts that continue today. And so how do we tailor our strategies to, to make sure that that can be addressed? Uh, Part of, there's a lot of tools that are available on that. I mean, you look at, you know, you say our AB 617 program is one of many tools available. You have other programs that are out there well uh, as well. Uh, you know, are there ways to tailor incentive funding specifically to disadvantaged communities? Um, there's, you know, ways to, to try to do that. Uh, this air quality management plan specifically does try to look at environmental justice and, and uh, some of the measures we have been looking at uh, uh, for example, you can say some of the building electrification measures that we've been uh, uh, proposing as, as a part of this plan, making sure that these measures are affordable. So what does that look like? And, and you know, how do you des develop incentive programs and future regulations so that uh, these clean technologies can be adopted by uh, those who might traditionally not be able to go for those expensive technologies? And can you develop incentive programs that do that? Uh, there's, so there's a lot of discussion and an entire environmental justice chapter to, uh, to walk through some of these issues, but you know, the, the details are really going to matter in this, and that's largely going to come during the measure development when these programs are actually being uh, fully fleshed out and you know, brought for consideration to our board. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we really encourage uh, people to continue to provide feedback, not just during the EQMP, but as we continue to develop these measures uh, to provide that feedback, because not one solution will fit all programs. We have a reclaim program right now, which is sunsetting, right? And there's been a lot of concerns that we, we've heard about the reclaim and that, that program is sunsetting. And that's a specific approach that works there. Uh, but then what would you do on mobile sources or what would you do on building measures or what do you do on incentive programs? You're going to have to tailor that. Uh, to each one of those. And so we are really interested in this topic. Uh, glad you're raising it here. And But it's, those details are going to matter in each one of those measure approaches. So, so you're still working out the details of how to approach so things aren't backdoored like they were reclaimed, but your incentives are going to be well well tailored to make sure that that doesn't happen. And, and we'll see that in the outcomes in, in the future. Uh, that, that really is the goal. And I think as each one of these programs is sort of more fully developed, we have the public process for the EQMP. That is the overall blueprint. But then a lot of programs fit underneath there. And so it's as each one of those programs are developed, we're going to have continued public process because we really want to hear from folks such as this group and yourself and, and others, uh, you know, for example, on environmental justice concerns. Well, how does that affect that specific program and how can we tailor that program the right way? So it's a continuing dialogue and conversation on this. Okay. Yeah. And I was looking for the outreach piece and I saw public meetings coming up, but the details of the other public meetings are, I'm more interested in, you know, in terms of the, the, the scale and how we're going to reach the people, let them know and find out, you know, what their concerns are about these measures and how, you know, historically they've been, you know, kind of left out in terms of the environmental justice component. So I look forward to hearing more about how that plan rolls out in the, in the, in the next year or so. Thank you. Thanks, David. Manuel? I'm unmuting myself. Let me see if I can, I won't get lost there. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, point out that I, I'm very, since I've been on, involved with this committee and, and even before I've seen the, all the improvements that have, been, that have occurred to, uh, to the air quality in our area, and uh, I think in all the area, but specific, specifically, I, I'm more familiar with the Coachella Valley. And this report, this draft plan that I see once again points out as to how well basically AQMD is doing our, our, our uh, the agency and the staff. And I mean, all the meetings I attend to, they're, they're very, I mean, there's so much information and so much work that's being done that's having a big impact. And that's one reason, of course, if you saw the, the, the chart where there's a, there's a the, our line here in the Coachella Valley is going down as far as um, uh, pollutants. Uh, but again, one of the things it points out is that the biggest problem is with the area where we have very little control, which is the off-road uh, pollution, or actually it's, it's on road also because I'm, I'm talking about the uh, um, truck traffic and the um, uh, port traffic and all those things that are uh, railroads that are that are actually the the source now the, the biggest source of pollution but we have so very little control because it comes under the umbrella of the federal government so that's one thing that at some point we need to start thinking as to do we need to change our approach uh, and using uh, there was this report that our staff is, is putting together and uh, trying to open the eyes of uh, the federal people to change the laws so that we can basically have an impact on that. Because otherwise, in all the other areas that I see, I see a lot of improvement. I see, and as a, as a matter of fact, that's why our air quality has improved quite a bit because of everything we've done. But the biggest source of pollutants is still coming from areas where we have very little control. And that's the thing I think we need to uh, start focusing a little bit more on. Definitely. Very thoughtful. Thank you for those comments. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to public comment and see if we have any of our attendees that are that have a question. I don't see any hand raise. Um, so I'll just ask one more time if anybody in the committee has any other questions for staff on the AQMP presentation. All right. See none. Thank you everybody for being present for this important discussion and for all the committee members to continue to be engaged on this issue. And it will come before the board. We're projecting December, right? That was December. Okay. 
Um, let's go back to item number one to the, I'm sorry, item number two, the approval of the meeting minutes. We held this off because there wasn't a quorum earlier on. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? I'll make a motion to approve. This is Kareem, Madam Chair. Awesome. I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion. It's been seconded. Can we get a roll call on that motion? Senator Delgado? Uh, yes. Supervisor Rutherford? Yes. Board member Padilla Campos absent. Elizabeth Alcantar absent. Ritter Alexander absent. Manuel Arredondo? Manuel Arredondo? I see him. I'm I sorry, I, I was muted. Yes, I, I vote uh, yes. Oh, perfect. Angie Balderas absent. Dr. Larry Beeson? Yes. Suzanne Bilodeau? Yes. Paul Cho absent. Carrie Doy absent. Dr. Afif Al Hassan absent. Mary Figueroa? Yes. Angela Garcia? Yes. Kareem Gongora? Yes. Anna Gonzalez? Yes. Dr. Monique Hernandez, absent. Dr. Jill Johnston, absent. Humberto Lugo? David McNeil? Yes. Daniel Morales, absent. Donald Smith? Donald Smith? I see he's unmuted, but we're not, we're unable to hear him. Can he raise his hand? Donald, are you able to raise your hand? He might've dropped off. Okay. Rafael Yanez. Yes. Motion passes 11. Great. Okay, so meeting minutes from April approved. We received in file item number four, and that brings us to item number five, uh, rule 403.2, fugitive dust emissions. And that presentation is gonna be made by Eugene King. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so good afternoon, my name is Eugene Kang. I'm a planning and rules manager here at South Coast, uh, and I'll be giving a brief presentation on rule 403.2, uh, fugitive dust from large railway projects, which was newly adopted this past June. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Uh, so to provide some background, uh, construction and demolition activities for large railways uh, large railway projects typically involve crushing and grinding operations, uh, earth moving activities and maintenance of material piles, all of which can uh, generate fugitive dust. And some of these large railway projects are located very close to communities, which are already disproportionately impacted by tailpipe diesel emissions uh, and other pollution or air pollutants from mobile sources. Uh, now, although South Coast AQMD has some existing rules uh, to generally control dust, there are, there are minimal requirements to preempt fugitive dust exposure situations caused by large railway projects, uh, and also minimal requirements to provide project information uh, to the public, including how to contact the project directly regarding dust issues. Uh, Rule 403.2, recently adopted in June, fills this regulatory gap, uh, and it's a new rule that supplements existing South Coast rules for dust control. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, rule 403.2 becomes applicable once any rule specified activity for a large railway project uh, is conducted within a thousand feet 
of an area of public exposure or sensitive receptor. Uh, the rule defines a large roadway project as activities for the construction or demolition uh, of a large roadway, including any adjacent bridge, uh, overpass, on-ramp, or off-ramp. Uh, and how the rule defines a large roadway is an interstate road, freeway, uh, or expressway per the functional classifications uh, established by the Federal, Federal Highway Administration. Uh, this can also be determined using web tools available on the webpage for Caltrans, uh, the state agency. Next slide, please. Uh, so requirements become effective um, for any new large railway project, January 3rd, 2003, uh, and requirements include general prohibitions for aggregate crushing and grinding operations uh, and maintenance of material piles that are within 100 feet of an area of public exposure or 250 feet uh, of a sensitive receptor. Uh, there are some allowances to the prohibition if advanced controls are used uh, and specific operating conditions are met. Uh, for aggregate crushing and grinding, this activity would be allowed within the prohibition uh, zone or buffer uh, if it's recycling materials generated on site for project use uh, and is conducted using a water misting uh, dust control system to prevent uh, visible dust emissions from extending 100 feet from the activity. Material piles uh, can also be maintained within the prohibition buffer uh, if they're covered using a material pile cover or other equivalent control methods approved by South Coast. Uh, these conditional allowances provide flexibility to affected projects, especially where space is tight or limited, uh, while still meeting the same air quality objectives to prevent situations uh, of fugitive, of fugitive dust exposure to nearby receptors. Next slide, please. Uh, the rule also establishes uh, additional requirements for specific large roadway project activities uh, that are conducted within 500 feet uh, of an area of public exposure or 1,000 feet of a sensitive receptor. Uh, those specific activities um, that are applicable or the additional requirements that are applicable to include aggregate crushing and grinding, uh, construction and demolition activities, uh, earth moving activities, uh, movement of construction vehicles over unpaved roads and maintenance of material piles. Next slide, please. Uh, so these additional requirements that I mentioned include having a dust control supervisor uh, for the large, large railway project uh, that has been trained and certified to ensure compliance uh, with rural requirements and also to act as uh, a point of contact with the public regarding dust issues or concerns. Also required are additional controls or dust control measures uh, for the specific activities of maintaining material piles and unpaved construction roads. Uh, there's requirements for project signage uh, and also requirements for record keeping to document and demonstrate that rural requirements are being complied with, including details on dust controls implemented, such as the duration and the amounts of dust suppressants used. Next slide, please. Uh, another key requirement is that projects would have to notify South Coast AQMD and also all receptors located within 1,000 feet of a large roadway project activity at least five days prior to start of work. Uh, the notification would help to inform the public of project details and contacts in case uh, of dust issues or concerns. Uh, lastly, the rule provides some exemptions for roadway project activities for emergency situations and service disruptions. Uh, best management practices for stormwater prevention and safety, uh, and also maintenance activities that you know typically have a low potential for generating fugitive dust. Next slide, please. Uh, so in closing, uh, next steps for Rule 403.2 implementation, uh, South Coast is actively working on incorporating uh, Rule 403.2 requirements and guidance into existing South Coast AQMD dust control classes. Uh, we anticipate this guidance to appear in curriculums for the class sometime next month. Um, the two and a half hour class is currently offered to the public free of charge, uh, currently via Zoom every third Wednesday of the month until further notice. Uh, and there are also no classes held in the month of December. Uh, a reminder that successful completion of this class is required for dust control supervisors required in many dust control rules, including Rule 403.2. Um, and those dust control supervisors oversee applicable operations uh, and also ensure that rule requirements are being met. Um, however, this class can also be useful for folks not required under the rule, such as you know, city planners and city managers. 
uh, just to kind of know what's going on uh, as far as requirements in their community. Uh, and we will also continue looking where we can provide additional outreach and information on rural applicability to affected communities, uh, possibly through meetings for AB 617 and other community-based meetings. Uh, so that, that concludes my presentation and I can open it up to any questions. I just wouldn't say thank you, Eugene, for getting dressed up for us today. <laughs> I feel very underdressed. I, I feel very overdressed. But, um... <laughs> All right, Angela. Hi, Eugene. Is there a location on the website that, that gives us a database of the projects that have them? You know, I do. I live in an area in Fontana where there's a lot of development of big projects and dust mitigation measures are a problem for the neighboring um, homes. So is there a place where we can get that information of who the contact person is that um, that we need to contact when there is no signage and it is a project that has more than whatever that requirement is that triggers them to need a permit? Right. Um, I mean, so if you want to notify the district, there's always one I have to cut smog you can do. Um, but as far as listing of projects that would be going on that might be applicable to this rule, um, mm -hmm. the rule is not effective. I guess for these projects until after January 3rd, 2003, I'm sorry, 2023. So once we get notified, because we will, there's a notification requirement, we can try to help and provide a listing of those projects. Um, it most likely or could appear on our current dust control rule or dust control webpage, uh, but we'll explore uh, you know, different, different ways that we can get that information out to the public. Yeah, because I, I do see that there is a lot of, and I know that it doesn't pertain to the 403A, but I know that, you know, we were having a lot of issues with um, Rule 403 in areas of construction. Right. Specifically, right during the Santa Ana winds. So I just wanted to see if there was somewhere on the AQMD website that, you know, that the public can readily find that information. Right. Uh, and what I forgot to mention, there's also a Caltrans website, right? They do have a listing of some of these projects. Uh, but we can work with College Caltrans to see if they can provide a more exhaustive or comprehensive list. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Rafael? Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Great information. Um, does it have teeth? Are uh, there fines associated? Because, you know, we've called in, you know, we call in numerous times for fugitive dust emissions, um, you know, odors, whatever the case might be, as we all know, if there are no fines associated with it, guess what? They don't really care about it. They're just going to continue their operations as usual. If there's no fines associated with it, sure, they can issue, the inspector can issue a, a warning, uh, something written, an OV, whatever the case might be. But unless there is something punitive, companies are not going to take you know, this rule to heart. And that's what we need. We always need rules that have punitive damages and they could be escalating <clears throat> going from maybe like hundred bucks for the first, or uh, that's too small, of course, uh, especially given these are multi-million dollar roadway projects. <clears throat> Generally, you know, they should, uh, you know, correlate to perhaps the liquidated damages uh, per day that are assessed by the contract. So that would equate to somewhere about $500 to $1,000 per day. So that would be my recommendation, especially if you guys have not, you know, incorporated fines into this. Thank you. Hi, I can respond, uh, Rafael uh, Nicholas Sanchez, Assistant Chief Deputy Counsel. So the the structure for penalties under the Health and Safety Code applies to pretty much all of our rules and so it is a tiered system starting with strict liability, then it goes to negligence and intentional conduct. So the legislature has identified under section 42403, the factors that a operator or facility can raise to mitigate against a violation. We do share your concerns on the caps for some of those uh, penalty amounts that, that they are low um, Christina Garcia passed legislation as part of AB 617, where we get to add CPI consumer price index to all our penalties. It's currently at 9.1%. We post what that number is on our website every year in the penalty section. 
Um, but, you know, what we typically do, Raphael, is, you know, there is some learning curve often with these facilities. And then the ones that have the sophistication of what you've identified were not as um, accommodating. Um, we expect them, especially if, the particip if they participated in the rule development process, that they should be adhering to these requirements from day one. Um, but there's always negotiation involved. Um, and we do expect them to pay penalties when they violate our rules. Um, and we don't want it to be part of doing business for them to, um, you know, ignore what they're required to do. But obviously each situation is different, but, um, you know, we will be tracking this rule and making sure that the outreach is there. So when it does become effective, we address it appropriately. Thank you. So how many, thank you, but how many, how many NOVs does it take? Because clearly it takes, you know, hundreds of complaints in order to even get one NOV. How many NOV does it take for the district to go ahead and start that lit litigation process in order to assess one of those fines? One NOV subjects a facility to a fine. Okay, got it, thank you. All right. Thank you for that. David McNeil, and then we'll go to Kareem. Uh, this is great information. I appreciate the the, the, the legal input, uh, uh, analysis on this as well, because that was my first question, how much are fines? And more importantly, I think what, what I said, the notification, I saw the notification was they mailed addresses within a thousand feet um, and they, they mail a letter to them. Um, I'd, I'd be very interested in, 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 in the crafting of those letters. Not, I'm not doing it, but I'm saying how the letters, letters are crafted and how the signage, I would hope that these signage as well, you know, posted, you know, around the site where you could call a number other than 1-800-CUT-SMOG because enforcement, you know, is really, you know, on their, their on-site person that's managing the, the responses. But most importantly, with the be, signage being a requirement question, is it a requirement at the site or around the site? beyond the letters and then second piece is it possible to in these notifications to the public and on the signage to cite the rule and the fine limits or amounts in the in the notifications to the public so they know it's not just a phone call that's going into the wind that you know that and 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 the and the, and the, and the, the, the operators know the, the, the I mean, probably caltrans mostly doing most of the work but you know let people know hey we're doing this construction we are responsible for mitigating dust under this rule. You know, if we are violated, you know, we are responsible for paying this much money uh, or, you know, fines of the, up to this amount, um, you know, so please contact us, et cetera. And even on the signage, you know, this applies to this rule and if we violate it, you know, we're subject to penalties under the rule. Just to have that message out there on both sides so the community knows that there's teeth in it as well as the the, 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 the construction entities know, because sometimes it's subs, you know, not just the, not just the major, uh, major uh, public works people that are doing the work. Right, and I, I can answer, uh, I'll just take the first question you had on signage. Um, yes, that's a base requirement. So you will uh, expect to see uh, at least one sign. Uh, it really depends on, you know, the entrances and the sites and, uh, a minimum of, of two signs would be required per site and a minimum. Uh, and that information that's on there is going to provide who you can contact for the project um, and, you know, phone numbers and things like that. So you can talk directly to someone, the dust control supervisor for the site, if there are any issues or concerns. And it'll also have information for contact at South Coast AQMD. Uh, so that's on the signage. For the notifications, uh, there are base uh, requirements for what needs to be in that notification letter to the public. Uh, you know, some of the things are start times and start dates or end dates for the project itself. Same thing, you know, who, who you can contact, um, and, you know, both from the project itself and also from AQMD. Um, those notification forms, we did have some sample ones that were provided in the rule package when it was adopted. Uh, and we plan to provide those forms, those support forms, sample forms. Um, on our dust control webpage. So if you needed to see what it looks like, you can access that. Um, as far as like noting what fines would be associated with some of these violations, uh, that's not something typically we actually put on the notification forms. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, maybe Nick, if you can chime in on that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you're um, asking for, Mr. McNeil. The challenge is uh, the air pollution laws and the health and safety code are, I will say, complex. I think what you're asking for is like when you're in the carpool lane or you see those signs in, you know, public places, you know, littering or violating the carpool thing is could sub subject to up to a fine, you know, up to 250 or $300, because like I mentioned uh, to Raphael, it's, there are tiers of penalties. And so the facilities get their due process. So it's a sequence process where we get complaints, we conduct inspections, we issue violations, and then it'll go to the legal department for resolution of that matter. So it's, you know, that amount may not be very representative of where we end up. And so that's why it's, it's um, you know, we, we can't include all that information because it may not be applicable depending to the on the situation. Yeah, I mean, the messaging opportunity is there, fines up to or minimum fine of, um, but, you know, I understand it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope in terms of trying to put it out there, um, but I know that would incentivize both sides to say, oh, I, if I make this phone call and it's happening, there will be retribution uh, relative to it. And then in terms of the signage, as long as the signage is large, I've seen signs posted that you can't get to, you know, that are only, like you said, the entrances, Mr. Mr. Kang, but not, you know, where I can get to for, as a public member necessarily, because it's intimidating to go up there with the truck grates and, you know, all those things to drive up to get a number on a thing. So making it as, as, as accessible to people with large enough print uh, poster size, um, you know, um, th that, as big as their logo, at least, <laughs> uh, in terms of the information. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, David. Um, I, oh, um, Angela. Sorry, Eugene, I just want to have an additional question. I know that this is somewhat related to Rule 403, but um, is there another rule that applies for big properties that are, that just have that is just vacant land with a lot of dust and um, that their dust is going into other people's homes, like when they're driving their trucks around and stuff? Right, that's a good question. Um, right now, 403, existing requirements in, in 403 have uh, provisions for large operations. Um, so you will see some of the things that you're seeing in 403.2 already apply for those larger operations, signage, you know, dust control supervisor, um, you know, and there's also a uh, nuisance rule 402, you know, if, if that's actually getting to the resident, um, you can always, you know, be cited for something along the lines of public nuisance. So, you know, we do have things in place uh, for those that, you know, aren't really cap, you know, if it's not in the bin or category of a, a large railway project. Okay, so just um, out of curiosity, does 402 is, it's not a construction property. A construction zone is just a vacant land that has very fine particulate soil that, you know, anytime their trucks are driving around, it, it, it creates huge clouds of dust for the neighbors. You know, they've asked me about that. And I, I wasn't to look into it, but I thought that maybe while you're here, I could just ask you. Yes, free legal advice today. Um, Basically, the challenge with 402, and we, we encountered this a lot, is our authority is under public nuisance. Okay. So it's always that challenge from getting from a private nuisance to a public nuisance. Obviously, we evaluate each situation differently and say it's like you're saying a remote area. And so you're really not going to have large amount of people that are impacted by this. And so we could evaluate each scenario and determine what 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 authority. And Derek, am I entertaining you? He's laughing. Right. <laughs> but, he um, very funny. So yes, but yeah. So I mean, definitely call. That's what we're here for. We'll evaluate it. If, if there's a way to segue from <laughs> private nuisance to public nuisance, you know, we we can we can evaluate that. You know, what's in that material. Um, but yeah, each situation is unique. But yeah, I mean, we encounter this a lot. Is we just don't get the number of complaints to, to, to get it to the public nuisance level. But um, obviously we will engage with, you know, the alleged violator and maybe that may just trigger some positive outcome, you know, for the situation being impacted by those individuals. I think that's a good start. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to ask uh, if there's any members of the public that uh, would like to speak on this item. Um, it looks like we do. We have uh, Moses Huerta who would like to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Moses Huerta. I'm an advocate here in the city of Paramount, also former public safety commissioner. A uh, quick question on the dust. I know that uh, also, will this dovetail into the Prop 65? Uh, as an example, there's uh, uh, quite a few cement factory uh, uh, processing facilities in my town, for example, and I know they have this Prop 65 signs out there and how are they supposed to control with that? How would that relate to this? Uh, in, in relation to the rulemaking as far as controlling dust. Um, and also, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm able to comment on the HMP. I did have a question there, but for now, this is my question on the dust issue. Thank you. Thank you. And, and sorry, can you uh, let us know again what facility uh, and what, I'm sorry, what facility type that you were speaking of again? Sorry. So, for example, it's a cement processing. So, uh, one of the concerns that I have here in the city that we're working on is uh, the hexavalent chromium. As you know, uh, concrete and cement is being processed openly. So, I know that they have the Prop 65 signs out, among and also the signs that say call uh, AQMD. But would the would the rule be incorporating those dovetailing into the Prop 65 or uh, other signage or control dust, if, if I may? Because that that's why I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. If it was possible to clarify that. Yeah, I mean, I can try taking a, sh a shot at that. I don't know if um, anyone in planning wants to fill in, but so there are different requirements under Prop 65. I think the one that you're seeing on the site is the obligations under with the Attorney General's Office for California. Um, our authority is dealing with illegal discharges. Um, and so, or if we see um, pollutants or constituents that either we measure or we know have exceeded a certain threshold that triggers our obligation, the air districts to issue Prop 65 notices. So there, there are different requirements. Um, and so that Prop 65 is gonna be independent of any of our rule requirements. If, if um, something triggers our notification obligations, we will do that independent of, of what, what is in the rule. Right, and, and I can answer a little bit on just, you know, what rules and well, first, if this rule 403.2 would apply to um, the facility you're speaking of, but, but no, this, this rule actually just applies strictly to large railway project uh, activities. Uh, you know, we do have a rule on the books, uh, rule 1156, that does control um, particulate matter um, from the facility that you mentioned. Uh, although it doesn't specifically get at hex chrome, um, it's particulate matter, right? So you. You, you do indirectly control it in that, in that fashion. And again, also 402, if anything's crossing beyond that property line, uh, we would encourage you to you know, go ahead and call 1-800-CUT-SMOG. Very good, thank you for the clarification. Okay, um, and it looks like we have Kareem Kangora who would like to speak. Yes, thank you, Chair. I have a more procedural question um, and thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate it. It was very succinct, straight to the point. What level of integration or communication occurs with water quality management plans, if any? I know they're separate agencies, but there's a certain situation in San Bernardino, has a stockpile, and uh, I'm just wondering if we coordinate with agencies when it comes to issues like that. Yeah, I mean, I have very limited information exactly what, you know, they would do other than the stormwater prevention um, measures that they have. Uh, they should be, there should be some type of measures in place. So uh, they do prevent runoff. Uh, but as far as this rule is concerned and our kind of coordination or collaboration with them, I'm not able to provide as much input as you may want. All right, thank you. Okay, and I don't see any other hands raised from the public. Um, and this is a receive and file item. So we'll head Back to uh, item number six, member updates, other business. Is there anything else that any member of the committee would like to uh, bring up at this time? Don't see any yes. Oh, Mary, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is Mary Figueroa. 
Um, so I have a I have a question on a comment that um, I had written an email on during the last couple of uh, days, or actually within the last thirty days. When when board when the when the members of the committee have some information that we want to provide to the group, um, what is going to be the best way of handling that? Because I was hoping, see, the three minutes that we have for this kind of presentation. Um, you know, we're limited already, but yet there's things happening, especially out in the Inland Empire, um, especially with the warehouses that eventually end up impacting even some of the conversations we've had here this, this afternoon uh, on policies and issues. Um, but yet, I don't know how much of that you are aware of or how much of that would be helpful information that maybe you're not aware of. Um, and so I've wanted to pass on information like I was uh, calling in reference to a new group. It's called Riverside Neighbors Opposing Warehouses um, that has um, developed out here. And they're definitely becoming very um, strong. And um, they're looking at um, land that was formerly owned by March Air Force Base, which is now used as um, uh, an airport for several of the warehouses in the area. Um, so all of this is all interconnected. But again, my, my bottom question is, what is gonna be the best way to get this information to the rest of our EJAG members and to AQMD and their staff so that they know what it is that's happening out here? I can take that. Okay. Hi, Mary. Uh, Hi. Free to email me. I can send out an email to all of the members and give them my contact information, but I can relay the information to staff internally and then also to the group. Uh, now, what was that? What was the last part again? I can relay the information to the members and also to staff. Oh, fantastic. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll see. And that's, and I guess, because uh, I know right now we've had a bit of a change of staffing um, to the um, committee because I had sent an email to somebody and I guess it just went nowhere. It wasn't to you. So yeah. that's part of the reason that I'm asking. So if we send information to you, then you will be able to then disseminate it to the other individuals. Yes. Perfect. That's what I needed. So okay. yes, yeah, so I'm going to be sending everybody information on this uh, R now group that uh, has developed out here in the in the Inland Empire, and it would basically cover both Riverside and the Moreno Valley um, City actions. Uh, both of which everybody knows there's a large amount of warehouses that are being currently constructed out here, and uh, with that comes all of the uh, pollution problems with the trucks, uh, the rail and uh, now um, also the um, aviation part. So uh, definitely something that we should stay on top of and I appreciate it. Thank you. No Thanks problem. Sure that, I have a um, announcement. Yeah. Um, on September 14th, Wednesday, September 14th, we will be hosting our annual environmental justice conference. And this year we're excited to announce that our very own EJAG member Monique Hernandez, Dr. Monique Hernandez will be hosting as our MC. And um, we have some fantastic speakers. Um, our keynote speaker is US EPA Regional Administrator for Region 9, Marta Guzman. And then our fireside chat um, participant is going to be California Attorney General Rob Bonta. We have a plenary session um, about AB 617. And then we also have two breakout sessions about community air monitoring and also another one about zero emission infrastructure. So we're very excited about the conference. Um, we have over 350 registrants, but we really need your help to continue outreach. And we really hope to get your participation and also um, your input on the conference after. So if you have any questions about it, again, I'll be sending my email out and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, members of the committee, if you can send that to your social media circles and any groups that you're a part of, um, that'd be great. Kareem. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. 
I just wanted to um, highlight that California Clean Air Day is October 5th, uh, 2022. So you could go to cleanairday.org. Um, and I am a member of the Inland Empire Steering Committee. And so um, the chair there is actually uh, board member, County Supervisor uh, Manuel B. B. Manuel Perez. Um, so there's a, there, there's a plan to do some activities to kind of um, encourage clean air activities um, and kind of make that, that push to ensure that we're all working and focusing towards those type of initiatives. So just wanted to make sure I put that on record and that um, I'm not sure if AQMD has, I'm sure they're a partner, I, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware uh, that that's taking place October 5th, uh, 2022. Thank you. All right. Um, and our final item is public comment. Um, are there any attendees that would like to speak on any non-agenda items? I don't see any hands up. I Vice don't Chair. either. Um, so with that, um, unless Steph has anything else, we can adjourn the meeting on time. I did see, uh, Kareem, did you mean to raise your hand again? Yes, uh, it's a request uh, if we can adjourn in memory of. Do we do that here or? I'm very open to it. Okay, uh, so we just had someone who was a cleaner advocate pass away uh, in Fontana. She was a Rialto Planning Commissioner and a Fontana School Board member. Her name's Barbara L. Chavez. So you just passed in a very tragic accident on Sunday. So I was hoping we could adjourn in memory of. Barbara Chavez? Yes. Yes, we will definitely adjourn in her memory um, and the work that she did for air quality and environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you. Larry. Yeah, I just wanted to, I see that the, you have a note here. I just wanted to make sure that everybody noticed that on the PDF of the agenda, it said October 22. So. I see that it's been corrected to October 28, but just remind them that on the PDF, it still says October 22. Good catch. So uh, just make sure that everybody sees this slide that is the following Friday. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Larry. All right, everybody, enjoy your weekend and um, we will adjourn in memory of Barbara Chavez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.